Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is the series for the first three months of 2014. This series is entitled Discipleship, and this particular lesson is lesson number 10 for March 8 of 2014. It's entitled Discipling the Nations. Now that ought to be a challenge for Adventists. We've been trying to do that for quite a few years. What can we learn from this lesson? I hope you've got your Bible handy because we're going to look at a number of Bible stories and see what we can learn from those stories. But before we actually begin our lesson, we need to uh, turn our thoughts to heaven and ask the Father to bless us. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the many ways in which you bless us, the many ways in which you have blessed us with the truth, with a knowledge of the scriptures and with the help of Ellen White. May we now, uh, as we study these stories, these words from your holy word, gain a great blessing and understand more clearly what you would like us to do in reaching out to those around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some verses that we need to talk about in this lesson that should be hopefully has been memorized virtually by every Adventist. And one is one that I'm surprised the lesson doesn't mention. That's found in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached through all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, doesn't that sound like a verse that should be in this lesson? Yes. And haven't we Adventists claimed this as our call to action or one of our calls to action? I always thought so when I was young. So, um, another one we use all the time is found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. I'm sure you all memorized that probably from the King James Version. But that's another passage that we've taken to be our challenge to our... Is, is, work to be done. By the way, it's interesting to know it says, go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. That's the closest expression in the Bible to the title for this series. Make them my disciples. We, we've used it. We sort of coined a word, discipling. You won't find it in your dictionary, I don't think. But we say discipling. Uh, we've made a word in English to fit that. Only if you misspell it as disciplining. Yeah, we don't want it. We're not talking about disciplining. We're talking about no. discipling. <laughs> discipling. Doesn't discipling sort of mean that you become a disciple? Does discipling also mean that you make other people disciples? That's what Jesus says. I want them to join Make you. them my disciples. And there's one more verse we need to consider, and this should be particularly relevant to Adventists. The very first few words, for, well, first few words of Revelation 14, when what do we call this passage? I mean, not the first few words of Revelation 14, the first few words of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, which we call the, three angels the three angels' messages. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. Now, who does that not include? And he said in a loud voice, honor God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge, worship him who made heaven, sea, earth, sea, and the springs of water. In other words, worship the creator, right? And isn't that a major emphasis we've had to our observance of the seventh-day Sabbath as a celebration of creation and so forth? Well, how far back does the message to disciple the nations go in the Bible? looks least, like to Abraham. At least that far back. Yeah. Well, look at Genesis 12. Now, we've, we've passed over the story of Adam and Eve, and we've gotten down to Noah, and the next thing that happens at, well, there's a, one chapter or so about ba uh, the Tower of Babel, but then the next thing that happens is what? Yes. Wasn't Noah <coughs> uh, kind of a missionary? Yeah. To all the people around him, he was preaching for 120 years. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't go somewhere else. 
No. I guess that's the difference. Abram went somewhere else. God says, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home and go to a land that I'm going to show you. And then I'm going to drop down to verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. I mean, wasn't that, shouldn't that have been the rallying cry of Jews for the rest of, so long as they claim to be followers of, of Abraham, right? Did Abraham hear God say that, or did he dream yes. God say that? Well, it was in a vision. Must have been a pretty powerful vision for mm -hmm. him to actually pick up and move. Yeah. Now, now blessing the nations by him, that's saying that his offspring's going to do that, isn't it? His Probably. seed is going to do that. Well, so, ho hopefully all of his seed. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I was just kind of wondering the, at the title of the lesson, how am I going to influence the nations? Or are we supposed to look at it as a, us as a group are going to influence the nations? I'm sure that's what God intends. Well, another way to look at that is that through him was to come the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so Ultimately. That, that is going to... to but that doesn't on. mean the rest of us are supposed to be dead. Mm. I mean... We we can't we're not going to leave all the work to Jesus. Who would who would know about Jesus at all if some people hadn't said, okay, let's start printing some Bibles, let's start translating them, let's put programs on computers, let's, you know, <coughs> Jesus is on the internet. Yeah, Jesus has said put programs on the internet. Jesus has said do what? Go and make disciples. Who's he, who's he talking to? Everywhere. He's talking to all of us all and everybody out there. Yeah. Well, why did Jesus put, or why did God, it was Jesus, put the Jewish nation in the, in the country of Palestine, in the region of Palestine? That was roughly the center of the then known world. Yeah, it was the crossroads of the world at that point in time. You know, if you're going from Egypt to Mesopotamia, those were the two most powerful uh, regions. You have to go through what? Palestine. Palestine. So... Starting with the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, however, originally in order to protect themselves from joining the religious practices of their neighbors, they shunned those around them and would not associate with them at all. That included what group particularly? The Samaritans, who wanted to join them in making a new temple in Jerusalem, right? But they said, nothing doing, this is our temple, you stay out of here. And so the Samaritans said, what? That's the way you feel. Oh, we'll make our own temple. And then what happened? About 400 years later, one of the Jews, one of the Maccabees, who thought he was too, too, too powerful for his own good, decided it was his job to go up there and destroy the temple of the Samaritans. Now, where is the balance between going out and discipling and not wanting to pollute yourself? That's by the question. I mean, are we to go into the middle of a bar and start witnessing to the people? I mean, do we do we we send all our all, all our good um, pathfinders into the casinos in Las Vegas? Yeah. So I mean, there has to be judgment in. Mm -hmm. Well, reading the Bible, it sounded like Jesus went into those places. The way they were talking, I mean, the, the sinners, the prostitutes, wherever they were having parties, he would go. But he was so. morally strong enough. A lot of us, if we go in those places, we'll end up yeah. getting He's corrupted. supposed to have yeah. every, no advantage over us, mm. right? Uh, <laughs> well, look, think about the stories of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. We don't have time to talk about that right now, but think about that story. Think about the story of Jesus going he and he took his disciples and walked literally hundreds of miles to, to go up into the territory of Tyre and Sidon just to reach that one woman whose daughter was possessed by a demon. Why would he do that? Now, it's, I'm not saying that's the only thing he accomplished up there. Basically, he needed to get out of Galilee, and he did that, and he wanted this time to be set aside to teach his disciples. So presumably, as they walked along, they were learning. He was trying to teach them something. But then 
What about what happened to Decapolis? We've already talked about his, his discipling the two demoniacs, the ones who had been had cast out thousands of devils. And he's influ impacted the entire region of the Decapolis. And were the disciples getting the picture? No. Not really. When Jesus disappeared, how, much effort, how many efforts were they making to reach out to the Gentiles? None. None. A big fat zero. I don't think it's a good idea to go in bars to talk to people because you're talking to the alcohol. But I think you could wait before they get in there and try to talk to them, pass out some I'm, things I'm, to I'm, them. I'm sure the bar owner would be delighted if you're <laughs> out yeah. there <laughs> trying to prevent people from going into the bar. Now, there was times in the Old Testament, though, it looks like Israel got in trouble by mixing with the outside yeah. and especially with getting married and that kind of thing. Uh, don't you think that that was just kind of a reaction that kind of built up to kind of keep everybody together, stay away from those guys? Well, and why was that, why was that a problem? What, what's that? The well, here, here, I mean, Joanne said it a little while ago. See, what was supposed to happen, they were supposed to be so committed and so firm in their religion that they could move into these areas and convince the pagans to become Christians. And what was actually happening? Yeah, just the opposite. They were moving out there and they were being... Now, when they, they moved into the promised land, though, God told them to kill everybody, get rid of them all. But that's not what he told them at the beginning. At well, the beginning, that's true, but it ended up that way. Yes. And so now, um, you know, we got this, this time with Jesus where everybody's staying away from the Samaritans. Yeah. And I can see why that happens. Yeah. We have Ezra and Nehemiah to thank for that. <laughs> well, even today, do we go into another church, not ours, and come back and say, gee, we want to do that? Or do we go into the other church and keep our standards? Well, don't you need to, when you go in there to, to convince somebody of something, you, you reason with them, right? And you've got to have good reasons for, for doing one way or the other. What if they come back and they have a reason for some... Yeah. Thing off to the side there. Are you just going to say, ah, you're not from us, so I'm not going to well, listen to you anymore? I think it ah. depends how it's done. Yeah. We have clergymen's meetings of all denominations now. We join that. We have businessmen's meetings, Christian businessmen. We join that. Now, I think that's a better level to start than going into a pub and holding out a, uh, something, although I've heard of that being done once or twice, leaving signs of the times here <laughs> and there and walking out. But... Uh, there's ways around yeah, doing this. Do I, I've often wondered what would happen if we, we invited our church members sometimes says, okay, I want all of you over the next couple of weeks to visit one or two other churches. Maybe do it on a regular basis for a while. See what these, would happen. These are churches. These aren't nations. And this is, I, like, I like a little more aggressive approach. I like Jonah. Okay. He shows up in Nineveh and goes to town and I think we need a little more of that. This, Show us how to do it. This, this business of going in and having these evangelistic meetings and things, we need, to, we need to get in and just really let them have it. Yeah, but the people, are, how are you going to get them to come out? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're at home on the out. television or the internet or whatever. We have to adjust to the times. I can remember right. as a child, they'd come in and pitch a big tent and have an evangelistic service. You wouldn't do that today. No. You'd be run out of town. <laughs> There's other ways of doing it, and I think we, and I think we do it. I, I read recently, the United Nations classes 200, and I think it was 72 languages that are extant in the world today. Advent Radio covers about 230 of them right now as we speak, somewhere wow. in there. That's the way we're going to do it in our age. A lot of it, not all of it, but I think that's yeah. part of it. Yeah, it's well, still I don't know. It sure seemed like Paul. He just kind of charged in there and went to town. And yeah. Maybe we're just a little too namby-pamby. Yeah. <laughs> well, Isaiah is famous for his comments about preaching to the nations. Go to Isaiah. If you have time, and read from chapter 55, well, basically from 40 to, to 55. And he really, and let me just give you an example at the end of that, in, in the beginning of 56, my temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations. I wonder how often the Pharisees quoted that. <laughs> Not 
not very. And, <laughs> not if, they, very. and if they quoted it, how did they, use, how did they yeah. apply it? Well, the Pharisees were supposed to have part of the temple for all the nations to come in and stand mm -hmm. and observe what was going on. But this part of the temple, they didn't want to give that precious real estate to all the people of all the nations, and so they turned it into a shopping mall, mm -hmm. right? So uh, God's original intention was for um, other nations to come and observe what mm -hmm. his people were doing. Well. You've already mentioned the story of Jonah. What happened with Jonah? Of course, he got called by God. He went the wrong direction. He got swallowed by the whale. He, got, he, he witnessed to the to sailors. They threw him overboard, finally, at his insistence. He gets swallowed by the whale. whale he gets well, whale or big fish or whatever it was. He gets spit out on the shore. He goes back to work for the king in Samaria. And God says, Jonah, I still have a plan for you. And he says, oh no, not again. <laughs> and so he finally hauls off for Nineveh. For Nineveh, because what had God told him? Forty days and Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Nineveh's going to be destroyed. And he leaves Samaria. He says, watch this, guys. I'm going to go single-handedly over there and I'm going to wipe out the entire capital population, entire population of the capital of our worst enemies by myself. By himself? Well, he's he going by himself. That? Because he thought God was going to destroy yeah. them. Sure. You know, if that God was, told him that. If that was so successful at Nineveh, why doesn't God have, have a little more of that today? Yeah. You know, what we don't realize is the Holy Spirit was working on Nineveh. Mm -hmm. And so when we're told to go and do something, <coughs> the Holy Spirit may have been there before us to really prepare the people. Nineveh might have had a guilty conscience. What he about, did. <laughs> what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. Um, did Lot convince them? Nobody, yeah, the Holy <laughs> Spirit could have been there. I, even Jesus said, he said that if they had the information that you have now, yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah would have. Well, Nineveh repented. And Sodom and Gomorrah, they not only didn't repent, they they you know, Ran took over of half but, of the but family did they get of, of the, of did the they Lot. Get the same information that Nineveh, Nineveh did. That's, we don't know. That's my point, see. Lot was living there, a nice guy, mm -hmm. and and that wasn't that wasn't strong enough. You need somebody like Jonah to come in there and come evangelize. There. Last time we discussed about Nineveh, you mentioned that the economy of Nineveh was a war economy, yep. was it not? Their God was the God of war. And yet we live right in the middle of the biggest war, the biggest war machine that's ever li uh, lived on the, or extant on the planet Earth yep. and the universe probably. And we think we're going to go out to other nations. We can't even take care of our own here. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Are you trying to say we're in Nineveh? Yeah, <laughs> probably even, but probably worse. Well, many of the minor prophets talk about making God's house, the house of prayer. Well, in the early days of the Christian church, what do we see? Paul went that way. In fact, we have evidence that disciples just literally scattered to the winds. Now, we, we Ellen White says, we don't know the stories. I mean, there's some other stories that are, are recorded in semi-reliable sources from ancient times that virtually all the disciples, all except John, probably suffered martyr's death. But I mean, some went as far as India, and Paul, of course, went w way up into some parts of Europe and, and so forth. I mean, and others went across to North Africa. England. Yeah. England Island, it was over there. Yeah, exactly, a few years later. Is, is, are we, is it inappropriate for us to expect the kind of conversion that, that Jonah had? Should we expect more of the kind of conversion that Thomas had, or whoever these other disciples were out in other countries, the disciples. It, it's just, uh, it's there, it's happening, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a kind of a low-key type of a, of a thing. It doesn't convert everybody, it's just but, wh how would a you handful compare, of people. How would you compare Paul with Jonah? Um, well, um, 
They're blue. They both went on a ship. <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> they're both male. <laughs> Reluct <laughs> reluctantly in one. Uh, different, different ears. <laughs> they both ended up in the ocean. They're both yeah. outspoken. Now, we really can't, don't know what to expect because in the book of Acts, the disciples were not expecting Pentecost. They were not expecting thousands to convert. So is our job just to be faithful and... and well, here's some advice from Ellen White. That's always safe, right? A prophet. Uh huh. She says, and she's pretty pointed about this, in the name of the Lord, let us lift up our voices in praise and thanksgiving for the results of work abroad. And still our general, who never makes a mistake, says to us, advance, enter new territory, lift up the standard in every land. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon the Isaiah 60, verse 1. Our watchword is to be onward, ever onward. The angels of God will go before us to prepare the way. Our burden for the regions beyond can never be laid down until the whole earth shall be enlightened with the glory of the Lord. Volume 6 of the Testimonies, pages 28.3 to 29.1. So that's, I mean, that doesn't seem to fall in line with Bible prophecy. I thought the, the history of the world is, it doesn't say everybody's going to embrace this. It says that, that oh, there's not going to be very many people that embrace it and things are going to get get bad. There's not going to be this big mess. Well, we started out with Matthew 24, 14 and 28, 19 and 20. And what does it say? Go and spread the gospel to what? Every nation. nation. Revelation 14. As people get shaken out of our church, just as many are going to come back in. So there is going to be a result from going out and talking to other people. So the, the end is going to come after we have massive conversions or after everybody has just heard well, whatever the message is. It's like the book of Acts, so that would be conversions, wouldn't it? Well, the end is going to come when God can just draw a line and everybody in earth will have said, okay, I either choose this side or I choose this side. And I, I see that as happening when Christians are put on trial, worldwide the, the, the results of these trials are announced or, or, we, or we get interviewed on, on even on TV and someone is trying to make fun of us, but we get a chance to say a few words and those words get a chance, just like the Sanhedrin listening to, to Jesus at the time of his trial and so forth. There were some people there listening who got the message. Those things didn't happen till Jesus till he made a public nuisance out of himself. <laughs> well, That's what we're we, will be Paul. we will be considered public nuisances so. at, at the critical point. In one sense, I don't think we are necessarily going to know when to finish. We are to keep trying as mm -hmm. long as we can. It's, it indicates God knows where to draw the line, like you just said. The time will come, it'll be obvious. I think we can't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, we've commented a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the, you know the passages. Look at Matthew 11, 20 to 24. The people in the towns where Jesus had performed most of his miracles did not turn from their sins, so he reproached those towns. Okay? And the first one he approaches is Chorazin, then it's Bethsaida, and then it's Capernaum. Now, where did Jesus make his home during his ministry? Capernaum. Capernaum. Where did he perform most of his miracles? Pretty sure it was Capernaum. Now, these are the words that are quoted here. How terrible it will be, the quoting Jesus, how terrible it will be you for for you, Chorazin. How terrible for you, too, Bethsaida. Bethsaida was the hometown of? Mary and Martha. No, that was Bethany. Bethany, I'm sorry. Bethsaida was the hometown of? Bethsaida. James and John. Okay. okay. If the miracles which were performed in you, now they had moved apparently down somewhere closer to Capernaum, but apparently their original hometown was up there, and maybe some of the other disciples too. If the miracles, Jesus goes on to say, which were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would long ago have put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on themselves to show that they had turned from their sins. And who put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on their heads? We just Nineveh. talked about a little, the people of Nineveh. I assure you that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to the people of Tyre and Sidon than to you. And as for you, Capernaum, did you want to lift yourself up to heaven? You'll be thrown down to hell. The miracles which had been performed in you 
had been performed in Sodom, it would still be in existence today. You can be sure that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to Sodom than to you. Whoa. Mm. So there were a couple of good people in those towns. He took a couple disciples out. So are nations held accountable or are individuals held accountable? Well, nations are made up of individuals, aren't they? I think the leaders of some nations might be held a little more accountable than some of the rest of us, but it still comes down to individuals. Why did Nazareth have so much trouble with Jesus? Trouble? What do you mean by trouble? Every time he went there, what did they do? They wanted to kill him. Isn't that trouble? Trouble with him. Familiarity. They were familiar with him. He was a hometown boy and Mm -hmm. showed them for what they were. Yeah. They were ready to kill him because he suggested that God was ready to bless the Gentiles. Mm. I mean, what what worse sin could you possibly imagine? God actually working for the Gentiles? What a dreadful thought. I mean, that's what they were saying, right? Well, it's easy for us to look at the ancient Jews and deride them for their behavior. But are we inclined to make the same mistakes? Why did the Jewish people get so upset when Jesus said things that they did not want to hear? So one of the things Jesus was unhappy with with Israel was that they were not discipling Gentiles. Yeah. They were cloistered and and in their own little culture and uh, they were not uh, that doesn't that, that, ooh that makes me okay. shiver here in Loma Linda. Are you are you are you ready <laughs> for some pretty straightforward comments? Uh-huh. We as Seventh-day Adventists have more spiritual life than any other people in history. We have been so blessed. How much do we owe to our fellow human beings? What are we doing with all that spiritual light? What is our responsibility? What is our privilege? I come here and do my part by taping. I see, okay. Well, look at a couple of verses. John 12, (laughs) verses 20 through 22. We talked about this before, but some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. Now, this is the during the Passover at which time Jesus was crucified. I mean, just before the, actually the Passover. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, now here's another one from Bethsaida, said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Now, you remember what happened back at the beginning, which, what direction was, was uh, Greece as compared to Palestine? West. West. And who came to witness Jesus at the time of his birth? Men from the east. Men from the east. So, in the very story of Jesus, there's people coming from the east and people coming from the west, long distances. To do what? To learn about the Messiah. So, what what does that tell us? If you have a message that God wants to be heard, what will happen? People will come from the east and people will come from the west. You remember what the Mayo brothers said in Rochester, Minnesota? What? Build a better mousetrap and the oh, world will come to your door. Yeah. And of course, they were practicing medicine. Yeah. yeah. So if people are not crowding into the Adventist church trying to learn what we have to say, Oh, you're careful now. You stopped your preaching and done gone to meddling. <laughs> we, well, I, I'm just asking, isn't that what we're supposed to learn here? We, we seem to be talking among ourselves, mm-hmm. talking among ourselves. We, I, we tended to think of the Pharisees as being the most diseased of their race, but it's obvious that the disease had spread all across the country, mm-hmm. spread rather. Mm-hmm. To the point you might say they were more or less incestuous, and I think we mm-hmm. have had the same problem. But you know what's... Qu- you don't mean those of us who live in the <coughs> ghetto called Loma Linda, do you? Uh, 
you know what's my case. <laughs> you know what's going to happen if if I if I follow this advice about what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to I'm not going to do anything big, but I'm going to do something small. Okay. Because that's all I know. And then God's going to bless that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have to get a little bigger and mm -hmm. commit a little more time to this thing. And it's going to grow and grow and go. And it's going to consume all my time. And I won't have any time left for the things I want to do. That's a small investment for eternity, is it not? What's going to happen if you actually accomplish that? Jesus is going to come back. Well, doesn't God, he won't give you any more than you can handle? So God won't fill up your time completely. Oh, he... He, 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 he would love to fill up our time completely. We, we should love to have him do that. Exactly. The, the problem with God is he gives you everything you can handle plus a little bit more. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> and then you have to you end up having to use it. You know the parable of the talents. I think there's a bit of a difference there. Yeah. And you've got to watch this. You can get a little too heavenly minded for your own and others' good sometimes. Yeah. Well, let me let me read you the end of the story of the Greek mm -hmm. the Greek story. Now you all you all remember these verses, but remember this comes at the end of that discussion. Jesus said to them to these Greek people, "It was not for my sake that this voice spoke." But for yours, remember, God actually spoke from heaven right down into the temple courtyard on this occasion. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone, everyone to me. Are we doing that? Well, how do you do that? what we're talking about. We're trying to answer that question. I know, but, but you say, are we doing that? Well, we're not doing that because we don't understand how. We don't understand how because we haven't talked enough. There we haven't done this because we haven't done this. And it just goes round, 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 round. I see. There's, so, there's a lot of uh, Adventist agencies that are doing it, the ASI and all the TV mm -hmm. and the radio. Oh, come but, on. They're not doing anything near that I think should happen <laughs> compared to what this Bible is predicting is going to happen. But let's be honest, most of us don't know the names of our immediate neighbors in our street. Mm -hmm. We probably know more than one or two on either side, if that, in some cases. Mm -hmm. So we're lifting Jesus up. How do you lift him up? Yeah. Is it just that you talk to him, talk about him all the time? I know some people that can talk about Jesus that are really boring I can you know? tell you. I can tell you my own personal experience. <laughs> now, I have a different kind of profession than some of you I know. I'm a physician. I work with a lot of very poor people. This afternoon, I had a lady come in. She and her husband have been through some very difficult times. Um, they've lost almost everything they own. Both of them lost their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And she's one of many people today that I said, you know, at the end of this discussion, I'm trying to help you, trying to solve your medical problems and so forth, I need to pray for you. And she just burst into tears. She just said, you know, and, and I've had many people say to me, you know, in fact, I had a resident that I worked with. We went to someone's home that had a lot of problems and I prayed for her. And he said, I think the best thing that happened that whole, we spent a couple hours with her. He said, I think the best thing that happened the whole time we were there was a prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, how difficult is it to pray for somebody? There's an expression, a word in due season. Okay. Doesn't have to be a lot. That's been lost from this community. Mm -hmm. Sorry to say. Well, I think it's, uh, you can enlarge it beyond here. Just those of us in our version of the Western world, the days of being neighborly and getting to know people are almost gone, and sometimes for good reason, but it can still be done. God is sending all sorts of people to us through our doors, mm -hmm. and we'll treat them, and we'll bill them, and we'll give them medicine, but we don't pray for them. Well, one of the points that Lesson wants... I, I, let me ex take yeah. an exception to that. There's a lady I did some work a couple of weeks for, and she worked as a surgical technician. A couple, you know, a couple blocks here from us here, and she's impressed. She'd worked here for about five years, and uh, one thing they do, they pray with the patient before they go into surgery. That's the yes. one thing. But I asked her, what What is the Seventh Day Adventist? What do you know about Seventh Day Adventist? Well, 
vegetarians. Yeah, and they go to church on Saturday. No, she it, 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 that was it was the the fact vegetarian. That's all she was there, and she's been around here for five years. I've tried to uh, get her to come to class. We'll we'll see what happens, but uh, mm -hmm. that's a. I mean, I'm not mean throwing lobbing yeah, bombs. It's just well, uh, sad. Let, let me give you another example from my own personal experience, and I'm not setting myself up of an example for anybody, but. Um, this lesson will obviously be broadcast uh, sometime in late February or early March, but for us, at the time we're recording, is Christmas season, so you see me wearing my Christmas tie and so forth. Well, I made, I, I prepared some small gifts, and I prepared, I gave them to my medical assistants and the people who, who work for me, whose salaries are obviously considerably lower than I am, as, than mine as a physician. I said, I need to share a little bit of this. And so I gave them. And one of these young ladies who has recently become an Adventist said, when she, when I, after, after she realized, found out what, opened up her gift and thought what I'd given her, she said, you don't, you don't know how much I appreciate this. She said, I prayed on my way to work this morning that I would get exactly what you gave me. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that an accident? No, I don't think so. Of course, we're, we're talking about a medical community where people are coming into yeah. our doors. People don't come into my doors. I'm, a, I'm an electronic... People just, come into your doors every day. I'm, I'm a, I work as an electronic assembler down here for Boeing and oh, put together electronic parts. Okay, so or, you're, you're giving an, an example. Right, okay. yeah. Well, so. we can have an angel in our yard and we can treat our gardeners as people that we want to witness to and give them maybe a, a special gift or something like that. Maybe some people have housekeepers and not be scrooges with the people that do come in. Boy, that's sure going to take a long time discipling nations mm -hmm. using that, that approach. No, it doesn't take a long time. All you have to do is say something really important and God puts it on the internet and who finds out about it? The whole world can watch if they want to. Well, I guess I better start putting a lot of stuff on the internet. Well, you're already you're already doing that. The internet. <laughs> what? Satellites, television, and the internet. Yes, exactly. Well, it's interesting that just before Jesus spoke those words about how I've been lifted up and I'm going to draw everyone to me, he said these words a few what about six seven verses earlier. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. What was he trying to say? Hmm. Turned everything upside down. Yeah? People what does who, that mean? It's a question of priorities is what he's saying. Yeah? Go on. We keep should talking. have a, a love for the world rather than a love for decorating our house. Maybe he's suggesting that we ought to spend more of our time trying to reach out to our neighbors. Exactly. Uh, how do you get that out of that statement? I well, mean, uh, I, mean what, I just what, want what, you to okay, put, the, put, the, put it together. Okay, I will for you. Okay. Okay, what are the things you like to do? What are the things I like to do? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like artwork. Okay. I okay. Like, um, like eating. What are the things you don't like to do? Things I don't like to do? Uh, Maybe witnessing. To, exactly. <laughs> See? So if you, if you do the things you don't like to do, but you know you should do. Uh, one reason why I don't like to do them is I can't do them very well. <laughs> isn't that, Maybe isn't that it's, showing it's, me that I'm not using my talents correctly? Maybe, it means, <laughs> Maybe the reason you don't do it very well is because you haven't had much practice. Have a much practice. I think what he's saying is if you're going to sit around and preserve your own hide till the yeah. day you die, you're not going to have a very good booking upstairs. Exactly. Well, is this like what Moses did when he said he rejected um, the things of Egypt for, mm. for this little bit of life, yeah. for that life? Right. Well, we've got some more stories to cover. Real, let's move on. What about the Good Samaritan? You remember the story. We don't have to read the whole story. Luke 10, verses 27 to 37. Here is this 
guy, he's a Jew, he's going on his way to Jerusalem down to Jericho, he passes through a narrow area, thieves jump out from behind a rock probably, and grab him and beat him half dead, steal everything he owns, and off they're gone. And what happens next? Along comes a priest, and he has his duty, so he passes on on the other side, says, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got too much to do. Along comes a Levite, and he says, well, you, you're in bad shape. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. He passes by. <laughs> and then comes the Samaritan. And what does he do? He bends over. He, I mean, he, he's waiting to be attacked by the same bunch of scoundrels that attacked the, rig, the first guy. Right? I mean, what, what's, what's to prevent them from attacking him? And so he... He, he, he dresses the guy's wounds the best he can. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to the inn. He pays the innkeeper to keep him until he's better. Okay? And you know what happened. Well, the interesting thing is, when Jesus told this story, who was in the crowd? The priest and the Levite. Probably. Desire of Ages, pages 499.1. Go read it for yourself because most of you aren't going to believe it. The priest and the Levite who passed by on the other side of the road were in the crowd that heard Christ's words. How do you suppose they felt? Hopefully pretty bad. <laughs> I hope so. There was so much... change, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. There was so much prejudice against Samaritans that the, rich young, the, the young man who came and asked the lawyer, who came and asked those questions... He would not even mention the name Samaritan. What did he say? I think it might have been the guy who was nice to him. Right? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, where are we going? Were the, uh, <laughs> is it perhaps <laughs> that priest and that, that Levite among others who were uh, converted at uh, Pentecost and after? Maybe so. I hope so. In, in light of that story, is there any question in our minds about who is our neighbor? Who in our world, in our day, is in the greatest need? Well, shall I quote Ellen White again? Thus the question, who is my neighbor, is forever answered. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Desire of Ages, page 503.5. And then, of course, there's the famous passage that says, If you've done it under one of the least of these, you have you've done it to me. Yes, exactly. Well, look at some passages by Paul. Romans 15, 12. Well, it's not Paul, but some of the other apostles. And again, Isaiah says, A descendant of Jesse will appear. He will come to rule the Gentiles, and they will put their hope in him. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Will the Gentiles put their hope in Jesus? You know, one of the things we overlook is, if you, if you read the story of the Gospels, and you find out hey, Jesus has been forming miracles in Galilee, who's coming to, take, to benefit from his miracle-working power? People from Tyre and Sidon, people from Decapolis, people from... It says right there, they came to Galilee to hear about Jesus. Do you think Jesus was irritating the Pharisees and scribes because um, the Gentiles, he was healing the Gentiles as well as the of Jews? Of course. Yeah, all of it. Yeah. Well, here's, here's, here's the disciples versus the Gentiles, okay? Acts 1, verses 6 to 8. When the apostles met together, now this is Acts 1, so it's what point in history? Right after Jesus' resurrection. After the crucifixion, after the resurrection, in preparation for Pentecost, okay? Mm -hmm. when the, in fact, this is, this is 10 days before Pentecost. He's on his way to ascend back permanently to heaven, Okay. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Isn't like, it? Almost like yeah. they hadn't heard anything. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it just. Uh... Well, they were all pr pretty patient. 
until that time. <laughs> I mean, a after they got to the point and said, well, this isn't going to happen. We better ask him mm -hmm. once and for all. <laughs> Jesus said to them that times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority and is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be filled with power and you'll be witnesses for me in Jerusalem so that he's going to reestablish the government in Jerusalem. No, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from the sight. What was his very last words to them? The commission to go tell. Go and tell the whole world. And we've already read Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We could have read John 11, 52 and 53. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, we've already read that. Matthew 24, 14. After, he said this again and again. After Jesus said that, before he went back to heaven, was taken back to heaven, did the disciples understand even then? Well, we know what happened about, what, three and a half years later. When persecution hit Jerusalem and started, I mean, they didn't do a thing. They didn't move one inch until persecution really hit them. And then they scattered. So and when they scattered, what did they do? Took the gospel with them. And so what was it that they said? I mean, when they were scattered? or No, when they, when they took that gospel with them. Oh. What was their message? What was, what was the message that they well, were we so effective? We have two or three sermons at, recorded at some length in the New Testament. And it, it, if you look at it, it seems like they followed more or less the pattern that Jesus used on the two men on the road to Emmaus. He said, look at the prophecies in the Old Testament. Look at the life of Jesus in the New Testament. Do they match? Yes. The life of Jesus is a fulfillment of those prophecies. Therefore, he is the Messiah. Therefore, we should do what he tells us to do and they would go from there to say, here's what Jesus taught, here's what Jesus taught, and so forth, and we need to do the same. Well, he, ha he did Bible study. There's something yeah. that the Adventists yeah. can do unlike any other person, mm -hmm. and that is Bible mm -hmm. study and bringing in the verses to prove this and that. It's mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. But you know, the, the, uh, the people of the road to Emmaus, they, they pretty well were theologians already. They knew the Bible. Followers a lot of the mm -hmm. Jewish people did know it. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, people don't know much about the Bible. So yeah. how are we going to go and, and say, you well, you. this is the prophecy? It goes back to what Christ said, the two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You don't have to act, think you've got to have a Ph.D. in theology. No, Keep it simple. So, so that, those are the two things. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you just said you were just going through the, the prophecies well, let's and, into and, it. Um, and making the explanation what of, of what, how Jesus fits into them. But, how, but if people aren't really versed in the Bible already, well, then how, well, it's a how is that going to gonna happen? Yeah, you, 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 they don't want to start. I don't know what you can do. You, I you, wasn't you, versed, and you just start from the beginning. And also, you know, love, a Buddhist can love, a Mormon can love, these other people can love, and you can feel really good around well, them. All you need is but love. The, That's the no, John but <laughs> it's, it's the Bible study that is really mind blowing. It's the mm -hmm. Bible study. Mm -hmm. It's to open up the Bible and see how it is a connected whole that isn't mm -hmm. really presented. Yes. But so, I'm very if you can show them some prophecies and then and, and fulfillments, uh, I think that they'll, they, they can't get that anywhere else. No. Yeah. It, it, it's it's a one unique thing I remember of Michael Camberiati years ago, mm -hmm. and he, when he was told him about, uh, he was given a Revelation seminar, and he talked about prophecy. Man, there's prophecy in here, and it just you know, a year later he became an Adventist. People, but, uh, people make jokes about the Revelation seminars, but they are wonderful. They are wonderful. I I don't think uh, even as as well versed in the Bible as Adventists are compared to most other, most other people and most other churches, I don't think Adventists know very much about the Old Testament prophecy. You get past, 
Genesis 3.15. I don't think they <laughs> know where those <laughs> well, things Genesis are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Except I'm there's a little bit in Isaiah, you know, which little, seems to... A little bit of time we've got left. I'm going to read a few more words from Ellen White. Although the work in foreign fields has not advanced as it should have advanced, yet that which has been accomplished affords reason for gratitude and ground for encouragement. Much less means has been spent in these fields than in the home fields, and the work has been done under the hardest pressure and without proper facilities. Yet, considering the help that has been sent to these fields, the result is indeed surprising. Our missionary success has been fully proportionate to our self-denying, self-sacrificing effort. God alone can estimate the work accomplished as the gospel message has been proclaimed in clear, straight lines. New fields have been entered and aggressive work has been done. The seeds of truth have been sown, the light has flashed upon many minds, bringing enlarged views of God and a more correct estimate as to the character to be formed. Notice what they're doing, bringing enlarged views of God. Thousands have been brought to a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. They have been imbued with the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 28, paragraph 1. What year was that? Volume 6 would be mm, about the mid-1880s, if I remember correctly. It is very easy for us to comfortably sit back in our pews and think that the work of spreading the gospel should be delegated to the pastor and our missionaries, right? And once in a while, we'll send them a little money to do it. We are not to feel, I go back to Ellen White, we are not to feel that the work of the gospel depends principally upon the minister. To every man, and I can add women, God has given a work to do in connection with his kingdom. Everyone who professes the name of Christ is to be an earnest, disinterested worker. What's a disinterested worker? He's not working for his own benefit. Ready to defend the principles of righteousness. Every soul should take an active part in advancing the cause of God. Whatever our calling, as Christians, we have a work to do in making Christ known to the world. Jay, to the world. We are to be missionaries having for our chief aim the winning of souls to Christ. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 427. Well, when Jerusalem was being rebuilt, the fourth degree had, Ninim, uh, what was his name? Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah going to finish the work, and Nehemiah was not a priest. He was not. He was a layperson, and isn't that he a model? He was a wine steward. He was a wine steward for the king, but yeah. he was a layperson, and isn't that a foreshadow that the work will be finished when the yeah. lay people get off their duffs and? Um, <laughs> it's not going to happen until they do. Yeah, and we're not we're not supposed to separate things into okay. Over here is Africa, and there's Europe, and there's Asia, and well, who wants to go to Africa? Mm. No. Do we even find it easy to put people into categories like these people are good, and those people are bad, and these people are residents, and these people are aliens? Or do we, do we even separate them into saints and sinners? Some of us need to go and evangelize Sin City, right? Well, I don't know, that's our calling. Try making a list of 10 things we share in common with all our fellow human beings. We don't have time to do it. It'd be fun if we had time to do it right here. 10 things that we share with all other human beings. Now try, trying to make a list of 10 things, excluding matters of faith, leave that off the table for right now, that make us different from others. Which do you think is easier? The parallels or the contrasts? Parallels. Much easier. Why do you think Israel failed in their original task that God assigned them? What should they have done that they did not do? Think. Follow what, <laughs> follow what God told them. They usually didn't follow him for too long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, what can we learn from their experience? What about Nineveh? Yeah. I mean, went in there and had a big evangelistic campaign and it worked, but you know, work for a few years. When yeah. God calls you to go to Nineveh, go. Well, yeah, but we're trying to get this thing wound up here, this work, and yeah. 
as soon as we get one patch cleaned up, we move on to another one, and then the, the old patch goes <laughs> back to its old way. How can we? Yeah, how can that's we? a problem. <laughs> it gets weedy again, huh? Yeah. Well, there's not a time for us to stop and say, all you people out there are outsiders. We're the insiders. We have the truth. You know, if you want to know the truth, come to us. We'll share it with you. In ancient times, the Jews divided everyone into, and you read this in the Bible all the time, Jews and Gentiles. The Greeks divided everybody into Greeks and barbarians. Why did they call them barbarians? They weren't Greeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But why do they call them barbarians? Their speech sounded like bar, 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 bar. To, to every Greek, it, anybody who didn't speak Greek sounded like they were just saying bar, 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 bar. <laughs> so they called them barbarians. Well, have you ever had the privilege of traveling or working in a culture different than your own? Someplace where you were in a minority. What was it like? Were you comfortable there? Well, there are two great lessons we can learn from spreading the gospel to others. And I think these are really important. One, as we try to tell the gospel story to others, we learn how much about the gospel we do not really understand ourselves. We need to study it and study it again and practice trying to explain it to others until we can express it clearly. If a lot of us were expressing it clearly, guess what might happen? Two, we might find, in fact, that as we seek to reach out to others, that they may have a lot of things to teach us as well. Did Melchizedek teach Abraham anything? Did Jethro teach Moses anything? There were a lot of things that Uriah the Hittite could have taught David. Now we have all the truth. You know, we can't learn <laughs> from anybody else. <laughs> who did the children of, I, uh, of, of Israel, the children of Jacob, who did they marry? Canaanites. Except for Joseph, he went down to Egypt and married an Egyptian. Well, we already talked about the story of Jonah. Do we really believe that God intends for all of us to go out there and spread the gospel, to live the kind of lives that Paul did, that Jesus did? Is that really, is that even possible in our day? Could, sh should we be reaching out to even atheists? Is that possible? Or, or other non-Christians? What are we doing? It's a challenge that I will place in your lap as well as in my own. Try it this week.